it's dark and warm inside. Not the good kind of warmth, mind you, the kind that hugs you in your bed in winter, but the warmth of sweaty bodies and backroom generators and things decaying in drains. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I am Tina. Today I am doing a single book review of The Inside Out Man, which is a psychological thriller by uh, Fred Stridham. <laughs> so this came out in 2017 by Talux Press. I don't know how I learned, heard about this novel. I, I honestly can't remember, but I bought it on Amazon a few months ago. I read it now because it's kind of Halloween-y. It was like a it's marked as a psychological horror story. I would say it's not a horror at all. It's more of a psychological thriller, if that. So what is The Inside Out Man? It is a mind trip of a novel about the effects of self-isolation and the lengths we'll go to lie to ourselves in the guise of self-discovery. <laughs> so what's the plot? Brilliant jazz pianist Ben lives from gig to gig in a city of dead ends. He is plagued by fragmented visions of the past and has resigned himself to a life of quiet desolation. That is, until the night he meets wealthy and eccentric jazz fan Leonard Fry. In the days that follow, Leonard makes Bent a devilish deal, proposing a bizarre experiment in which Bent will play a vital part. The deal provides an opportunity for Bent to start afresh, to question everything he knows, and for the two men to move beyond the one terrifying frontier from which neither of them can be sure they'll ever return, the borders of their own sanity. <laughs> the prose in this book, I will say, is utterly fantastic. <laughs> Bent is self-deprecating enough to be relatable, but not enough that he comes off as a pretentious whiner. Like, that's a very hard balance to make. Like, I tried to read Brett Easton Ellis, whatever his name is, and oh my god. <laughs> no. So yeah, this is definitely not that. Bent has a pretty tough life. He lives in a dumpy apartment. He's alone, and he scrapes by by playing piano gigs at bars. He's had a rough childhood too, so his demeanor and despondency make sense. You know, he's not depressing though, which is a hard balance to perfect. I, I guess I like him. Let me read you the first paragraph from the book because that's what drew me in. This is why the Amazon look inside feature is very important, at least to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I don't buy a ton of books because I buy too many. So uh, <laughs> I have to be very picky about what I purchase. Okay, so it starts off and it says one year later. There's a nightclub on the corner of Bree and Orphan that sits between a pretentious restaurant and a musty old bookstore. The fine dining restaurant does its best to make you forget where you are. It'll have you believe you're in a centuries-old landmark in France, which may never in fact have existed. It's always full of people more than happy to bolster the lie, all there to pretend for an evening they don't have to go home to lazy sex and laundry baskets in their charmless homes. The bookstore, on the other hand, is stacked from floor to ceiling with a shabby assortment of abandoned works. It is an orphanage for bastards, the issue of dead authors' love affairs. Nobody goes in and nobody comes out, and I'm probably not the first to wonder how the shop covers its rent. And then it goes on from there. But, I mean, it's a really intriguing, interesting start. Like, you can like, kind of picture it from the get-go. Anyway, if you like evocative inter evocative prose and interesting descriptions, you will enjoy this book, I think. The setting is also interesting because, on one hand, you have Ben's initial living arrangement that gets a lot of detail. Like, it's dark and warm inside. Not the good kind of warmth, mind you, the kind that hugs you in your bed in winter, but the warmth of sweaty bodies and backroom generators and things decaying in drains. <laughs> I love that image. But then later on, there's a mansion he spends a lot of time in, and it doesn't get a lot of description at all, aside from his, like, first visit. Yet, this has a purpose, like, this lack of description has a purpose as well as an almost thematic suggestion that wealth is itself isn't real. Like, it is a concept, you know, as we know, but sometimes we have to be reminded. The book is deeper than you think, I guess I can say, even while reading it, you know, which is why it's so compelling. When you get to the end, you grasp it's almost kind of it's argument, though I don't know if I can call it that. It, it, this book has lots of layers to it, and I think that's what makes it so interesting to me. Now, that being said, the book isn't perfect. There are some questions I had about Ben's life between his current age and his teenage years. The third quarter gets a bit off track, or maybe it's just too long. There's some fat shaming that was completely unnecessary. The italicized dialogue was annoying. Like, all dialogue in this book is in italics, and that, that I was just like, ugh. <laughs> and at times, the book comes off as trying a bit too hard to be lofty, yet when he succeeds at, like, a literary sentence, he really, really nails it. But some of them fall flat. I mean, most don't. I mean, I've read... Tons of books that where people try to be really lofty and you're just like, oh man, just stop. But this one, no, this one, it's just a few kind of false starts. Speaking of the third quarter of the book, I'd say it trails off a bit too long in the direction that feels not cliche, but a little bit overdone in the genre. Though the twist at the end of the novel is so good, it redeems this. And actually, I'm not sure the twist would have worked without it. So I'm kind of 
in between. I wonder if I were to reread it, if it were to, like, make more, be a bit more interesting because I know the ending. Anyway, I, I'm not sure because I'm not going to reread it anytime soon. Uh, the book teases you a lot, and I couldn't put it down. It, it's very compelling. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the twist because I have to talk about it. So jump to here if you intend on reading this book. Okay, so Leonard's deal is that he wants Bent to lock him in a room in his mansion for a year. Bent has to feed him through a slot in the door, you know, three times a day, but he's not allowed to talk to him. He's not allowed to, like, acknowledge him. Bent agrees to do this, you know, after thinking about it. And then he decides over the course of a few months to kind of take over Leonard's life and let him starve to death. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. It's just kind of funny. Other stuff happens, but it turns out that Bent in the end is Leonard. He has hired someone to keep him locked in a room for a year while he wrestles with his demons. His estranged father... So the reason he does this is because his estranged father bequeaths upon him a mansion and some money when he dies. Bent, who doesn't know his father at all, other than vague memories as like a four-year-old, he's torn by this gift because of his terrible upbringing and he wants to go into seclusion to find himself, basically. So Ben's trying to figure out, at least in my reading of the book, I'm sure you can get other things out of it, whether his, whether his father's, whether his father's money, had he grown up with it, would have indeed given him a better life. And would he have been better off if his mother had let his father take him from her, which he said, which he offered to do when Ben was about 10, you know, like, would that have changed his life in a certain way? Like where had his life had gone? And I guess he regrets a lot of his childhood, but at the same time, Maybe he feels guilt over this because he you know that his mother had had it hard. Anyway, we're, we're also not given the details as to whether his mother received money, money from the father at all and drank it away because it's obvious that she's an alcoholic. Though it seemed more likely the father simply left and only regretted his actions later in life. So, while Bent wasn't entirely impoverished growing up, you know, his mother didn't make it a very happy household. You could tell that there was, if not abuse, definitely neglect. And he was lonely. Everything Bent experiences while house-sitting Leonard isn't real. And that's the interesting part about it. Leonard himself isn't real. And well, the thing is, it's not like in some movies and books where he's, you know, projecting this image or he's hallucinating or he has schizophrenia. It's not that at all. It's that he's trapped in this room and his memories, because he's going crazy trapped in this room for a year, he, he's replaying the scenarios. It's almost like he's, like, making up a new scenario each time so he invents Leonard and he puts himself to to avoid you know thinking about what he actually put himself in there to think about so it, it, it's complicated <clears throat> there's also this character called Jolene who becomes Ben's girlfriend for a while in like the third quarter of the book who doesn't really feel like a real person like she's real enough but she's not fleshed out as a true character could have been had the twist not happened I would have been complaining about Jolene being a very flat female character but it actually makes sense that she is because she's like his dream girl basically you know she's tough a little quirky she cares deeply for her son and she's beautiful of course but he made her up she's actually based on a song that he used to listen to as a child that I guess like his um I can't remember if it was his mother or his father joked that he had like a crush on the woman in the song and so it, it all these little things that kind of are referenced earlier in the book, like, for example, there's a bunch of really weird paintings on the walls that Bent sees when he first shows up at the mansion, but they're showing, like, scenes from his life, like, his, like it shows, like, his mother's death, <laughs> and he's like, why is this painting here? And, like, at the time, you're like, oh, it's just a coincidence, but then you're like, oh, it's because, you know, he's entering, yeah, anyway, it, it, it's really interesting. <laughs> if, if you've read this book and you experienced it twice, did you like it the same way I did? Please let me know in the comments. Okay, so that was long. <laughs> it's because the twist is great and it has, it's, it's kind of complex. I had to talk about it for a while. The twist is great because like all good twists, it doesn't come out of nowhere. When it happened, I was like, damn, I should have guessed this. But the hints it dropped weren't so much hints, but like random spots on the map that when connected makes sense. There aren't clues kind of unless you piece them together after you read the whole thing. Like, so it's not like a mystery in the sense of like a murder mystery. It's, it's different. Anyway. I will add, though, that while being alone in a mansion for a year, getting paid for it and having some damn peace and quiet would not drive me insane whatsoever. <laughs> um, this book is is not really about that at all. Uh, it's not an all about isolation in a way that you think it is. It's very smart, very fun, very mind-mending, and I'll leave you with this gem. Nostalgia is a shitty picture in a shiny frame. <laughs> So I recommend this book for people who like the movie The Game with Michael Douglas from like 
1997, I guess. It kind of reminded me of that movie, which I've only seen like a couple of times, but I was like, this reminds me of that. Uh, uh, I guess Secret Window by Stephen King, like the short story or, or the movie with Johnny Depp, I guess. Uh, it's it's kind of kind of similar to that in a way or any psychological thriller, really. This book is proof that I do read and do enjoy books that don't have any female, that barely have any female characters, if you were wondering about that. I know that's something that I tend to focus on, but yeah, no, I do read books that talk, that deal with men. So there you go. Proof. Proof. <laughs> proof of that small fact. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, give that book a shot. If you have read it, let me know in the comments. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks.